take to the streets in Kimball to protest exotic dancers at a local bar. We have the rest of the story. You'll meet a South Dakota surgeon who uses his hands working with an instrument, but it's not only for music. And speaking of medicine, we'll show you a new form of therapy, although some prefer to call it fun. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Sherry Kurtz. And I'm Ted Coppy. The typical silence in the small town of Kimball has given way to the fury of controversy tonight. A citizens group that objects to female and male dancers at a casino bar lounge took their protest to the street tonight. People fighting the dancers presented petitions Monday night against the bar's liquor license and then held a protest outside the bar. Kimball City Attorney Mike Sebastian says the City Council felt it had been misled by the bar manager, Robert Rieger, when he applied for the liquor license transfer because he said there would be no major changes at the bar. Sebastian says having dancers is a substantial change. Rieger, the lounge manager, says he may take the city to court because the council pulled his liquor license after approving it. Protesters managed to close the bar last night, but tonight, despite protests from dozens of angry people, the live show went on. In a town where live Lawrence Welk shows were once a tradition, many people say they want to preserve Kimball's decency. Well, Sioux Falls police have closed the books on almost 100 office building break-ins with the guilty plea of one man. Today, 42-year-old Jake Fulkerson pleaded guilty to grand theft and three burglary charges. But as part of a plea agreement, Fulkerson also admitted to several other crimes, some of which he was not even a suspect. Authorities say several local businesses reported break-ins, many resulting in the loss of petty cash last summer. Fulkerson was arrested after two employees saw a man breaking into their office building and called his license plate number into authorities. Meantime, Sioux Falls Police and Minnehaha County Sheriff officials in a joint investigation have solved at least a dozen cases of burglary tonight. 18-year-old David Ernesti has been arrested on charges of burglary and an aggravated assault in connection with a macing incident, incident last month in Sioux Falls. Authorities say similar charges are expected on at least two other adults and several juveniles in the rash of burglaries. Some include rural and city home break-ins and the theft of more than $30,000 worth of personal property. Authorities say the cases appear to be drug-related. Students at South Dakota's six state-run universities are drawing a line in the sand at their activities fees. At a news conference this afternoon, state student federation members announced they'll do anything they can to fight a proposal that would shift most programs under the self-imposed general activities fee, which funds things like student unions and athletic programs, to the university support fee which takes the money and programs out of student control. Board of Regents Director Dr. Robert Tad Perry says the change will create unity and clarity at the six state-run universities, but the students call it taxation. It's third annual community service day. Beginning at 8 this morning, groups teamed up to spruce up parks, playgrounds, and more than a dozen areas in need of spring cleaning. The fountain in McKinnon Park got a new coat of paint while across town, the zoo was washed and scrubbed and also painted. Feel good to contribute to the society and it makes other people feel good knowing that you're there to help. Every year Augustana volunteers have helped sort donations and clean up the food bank downtown. The food bank's manager says she always has plenty of work for them to do because she knows they'll do a great job. As News 5 at 12 continues, if you want to point it out that the Midwest seems to be bucking a national trend. Economic growth in Sioux Falls is well above average at 4% compared to the nation's 2%. Dr. Sun says growth will continue, but businesses should prepare for a slowdown because labor costs here are climbing. Businesses came here in part because of a low cost of doing business. Now we are seeing higher cost of labor, higher cost of real estate, and higher cost of everything. So to some extent, the attraction which attracted businesses here in the first place, they are becoming less and less attractive. And Sun says if economic growth is going to continue in Sioux Falls, more emphasis needs to be placed on high-tech medical and financial service industries. In World Watch tonight, there's been a big economic slowdown in the Middle East. Yasser Arafat says travel restrictions on Palestinians cost $6 million a day. Thousands can't get to work and others can't export their products. But the PLO leader will return home from Washington with a $20 million loan from the World Bank. The emergency loan follows a meeting with President Clinton at the White House. Clinton agreed to set up a joint commission to examine economic problems of the West Bank and Gaza. Jurors in the Polly Class case have heard tapes of the defendant as he led California police to the 12-year-old's body. Richard Allen Davis has confessed to killing Polly Class. 
On the tape, he said he thought he'd feel better if he showed police the body. The free men will remain virtual prisoners in their compound. State and independent mediators today gave up their attempts to give them, get them to surrender. One negotiator says the extremists are not going to give up a promise they made to God to remain until their demands are met. Well, it's been a long wait, but it sounds like area farmers are in. Broadway Avenue for NBC Newsman and Yankton native Tom Brokaw. But the approval hasn't come without controversy. Tracy O'Halloran tonight has our top story. The controversy surrounding the honorary name Tom Brokaw Boulevard has nothing to do with liking or disliking Tom Brokaw or the $120 it will cost to post signs here on 2nd and Broadway and 31st and Broadway. It's a question of principle. And people were upset, basically. A lot of them were because of the way it was done. Uh, and a lot of people wanted to have the public input. Dave Hosmer is a commissioner who has been under scrutiny ever since the story hit the papers. He says the paper just didn't get the story right, and that's why people are angry. When they said that it was a name change, it was completely false. It was an honorarium. And when they said that it had already occurred and they put it in the past tense, and the language in the article, it was false too. But Jensen says Hosmer contacted Brokaw before he discussed it with the commission. And since Brokaw gave his permission, it seemed to be a done deal. So when you do that, you're basically committing the city, I feel, as a commissioner, because you're a representative of the city. Hosmer says if anyone wants to blame him for the controversy surrounding Tom Brokaw Boulevard, they can go right ahead. I told the, the commission tongue-in-cheek last night, anybody who moves out of Yankton or their business uh, because of this, I'll personally be held responsible for it. In Yankton, Tracy O'Halloran, News 5. Now, the new signs will be in place by August when Brokaw is expected to revisit his hometown of Yankton. Meantime, Commissioner Jensen is planning to start a petition drive to take the issue to a public vote. A South Dakota native is among eight people killed on Mount Everest after a blizzard over the weekend. 46-year-old Doug Hansen attended Aberdeen Ron Colley High School and then moved to Washington when he was 17. Hansen was a postal clerk for almost 25 years. His aunt, who still lives in Aberdeen, says his body will not be returned, but will be buried on the mountain as others have been. This was Hansen's second trip to Mount Everest. Last year, he and the others in his group had to turn back after getting within 300 feet from the top. A rollover accident near Andover in northeastern South Dakota has left one person dead. The South Dakota Highway Patrol says 35-year-old Patsy Sue Slade of Steen, Minnesota was killed when her vehicle rolled several times on Highway 12 just west of Andover. Troopers say Slade apparently drove onto the shoulder of the road and overcorrected the move, causing the vehicle to roll. Slade was alone in the car. Witnesses in the first-degree murder trial of 44-year-old Marlo Hoffman testified today that Hoffman told them he killed his brother. Hoffman's cousin told jurors that Marlo Hoffman told him he had killed his brother. Hoffman is accused in the stabbing death of 53-year-old Ronald Hoffman, who was found dead last June in his bar in Brant. Hoffman's trial began yesterday in Clear Lake. The city of Millbank is looking for a new police chief. The city council there voted this week not to renew the annual appointment of Bob Idy. Newly elected city council member Marcy Smith had criticized Idy when she was running for office, accusing him of hindering her attempts to get city crime statistics. She also said Idy had manipulated the figures to make his department look good. Idy has held the police chief job for about four years. Well, as News 512 at 10 continues tonight, a change has been approved in the reciprocity agreement between the State Board of Regents and the State of Minnesota. The revision affects Minnesota students who are enrolled in South Dakota professional programs such as law school or medical school. The revision approved today by the Regents says that tuition cannot exceed 150 percent of resident rates at the school a student is attending. Without the limit, those students would have made tuition rates exceeding those charged to regular non-resident students. Aberdeen Mayor Timothy Rich is in Washington today testifying on the importance of funding by the Federal Aviation Administration to airports like Aberdeen's for improvements. U.S. Senator Larry Pressler questioned Mayor Rich on the funding today before the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation, citing that small non-hub airports like Aberdeen's have suffered a dual blow in recent years when it comes to money from the federal government. Pressler today referred to testimony previously given to the committee by Dave Jagram, who is the South Dakota Department of Transportation. And he said he believed that the unpredictability of AIP funds are really harming air service in South Dakota and many other small 
uh, areas and probably nationwide. With respect to Aberdeen and neighboring communities, do you agree? I uh, definitely agree that the uncertainty of funding is a major problem for communities uh, the size of Aberdeen, uh, given resources that are stretched to the limit to rebuild roads, build schools, and other things. Airports uh, generally are not on the highest priority list. Aberdeen officials are asking for $6.8 million in airport improvement funds to help raise the level of their main runway, which will relieve a problem during the freeze-thaw seasonal changes. In World Watch tonight, federal investigators are putting a high priority on finding the cockpit voice recorder from Value Jet Flight 592. They're slowly piecing together the last minutes leading up to the crash. Meantime, family and friends of the victims will be able to visit the Florida Everglades crash site tomorrow for a religious memorial service. Well, it was only an aerosol can, but it caused quite a fuss at the Newark airport when it exploded inside a bag on a conveyor belt. Officials were forced to operate under bomb scare conditions for a few hours this afternoon after the bag carrying the can blew open. The bag was to be loaded onto an Air France flight headed for Paris. And a 15-year-old Salt Lake City boy is dead after a bus hijacking. He apparently shot a school bus driver in the leg, then helped her and the other children off the bus. A high-speed chase with police followed, which ended when the teen shot himself and crashed the bus into a brick house. We thought we had a lot of wind here this morning, but it sounds like there's a lot of strong storms moving through the western part of South Dakota tonight. Just what we didn't want to hear. Scott, can you give us any better news? He's standing by in the News 5 Weather Center. Well, not really. We did see some strong thunderstorms push on through the western sections of South Dakota. Now it's in Nebraska at this hour. Let's take a look at the almanac and show you what's going on in the eastern sections of South Dakota. Well, we started off with a temperature of 49 degrees, only warmed up to 57 in Sioux Falls, warmed up in the 70s in Pierre. We'll tell you why in a little bit. Normals are 70 and 45. Records are 96 and 29. We saw two-tenths of an inch of precipitation since midnight. We're still well below normal. 602 is the sunrise, sunset at 844. Let's take a look at the regional satellite map. We'll show you exactly why it warmed up in Pierre and not around here. Look at all the clouds right in the eastern sections of South Dakota, and still at this hour, that's the case. And temperatures really aren't cooling down because of that as well. But in Pierre, we saw some clear, partial clearing this afternoon, warming their temperatures up to about 70. Same with Mobridge and even in, to Aberdeen. But around the southeastern sections, really not a lot of warming up because those clouds stuck around. Only 57 it got for a high. Look at these other highs, though, in the 80 and 80 in Pierre, rather. 77 in Mobridge, 72 in Aberdeen. 70. All thanks to the Fraternal Order of Police Auxiliary. Members tied the ribbons on law enforcement vehicles today to raise awareness and show their support. You can show your support, too. If Tomorrow is Law Enforcement Appreciation law. Day, and the FOP is asking all of us to drive with our headlights on throughout the day. Well, coming up on News 5 at 10 is the philosophy of no dealing deals. And it's becoming a national trend in buying cars, but is it really a good deal? We'll find out in tonight's Five on Your Side Consumer Report. Bridging the generation gap, two groups in Sioux Falls learn from past and present life experiences. And there's a sweet sound coming from the halls of Sioux Falls City Hall. We'll tell you why when News 5 at 10 continues. by offering a fixed price for the car and customers shop just like they're buying any other item like groceries or clothes. Tonight on News 5 on your side, News 5 consumer reporter Beth Fuller takes us shopping and shows us ways to make the most of the new pricing system. 44,000 miles. Like many car buyers, the Christoffersons are full of questions about the vehicle. About how much gas mileage do we get? We should, we should get about 25 to 30. But if they buy a car from Ben-Hur Ford in Sioux Falls, one thing they won't wonder is whether they're getting the best deal the lot has to offer. We've been looking for a car for our daughter, and the first step that you take is to drive through and look at cars, and we've driven on some other lots, and there's, there's nothing to go by. There are no prices on there, so, I mean, if you're working from what you want to spend, then it's the first thing you have to know. Last fall, Ben Hur joined a nationwide trend of dealerships giving every customer what's called the best price, which means the price you see on the car is already lower than most sticker prices, and it's the lowest the dealership will go on the vehicle at the time. 
The idea of a fixed price received the most recognition a few years ago when Saturn announced that every customer would pay the same price for the same car. Since then, dealerships across the country have picked up the idea, but with modifications. For example, car prices may vary city to city. It's what the customers really wanted. The customers have told us that negotiation isn't a pleasant part of the buying experience and because of that we responded to that and said let's take the negotiation out of the buying process. They set their price based on the market demand so shifts can cause the price to fluctuate from week to week or city to city. South Dakota Auto Dealers Association Executive Vice President Van Johnson says the customer's best protection is still to shop around. What I'm finding uh, that's somewhat disconcerting to dealers out there is that people will travel today. I mean, they're much less uh, local market loyal than they have in the past. So far, Ben Hur is the only Sioux Falls dealership with the best price guarantee. They say so far it's working because when the customer feels they're getting the best value, they come back. For News 5 on your side, I'm consumer reporter Beth Fuller. If you feel you've been a victim of a scam or have a consumer story idea, give us a call at 1-800-727-5358 or 361-555, extension 43. Well, if supply and demand were a rule in weather, I think it's safe to say we'd all be willing to pay a premium for some sunshine. Scott Bowden is in next to tell us when we can expect our next peak at the sought-after sun next. Plus, we'll take you to a long-time Sioux Falls attraction to see what's planned to make it more appealing to you. Stay with us. Hundred lives. The Twister, packing winds over 90 miles an hour, lasted only 20 minutes but left a massive trail of death and destruction in his path. Some 33,000 people are injured, many of them critically. The Twister flattened dozens of villages where most homes are built of mud and straw. Bangladesh's worst storm in 1991 killed over 100,000 people. Truly incredible. Luckily, nothing like that here, and we actually have warmer temperatures on the way. No, if we all lived in straw houses, I think we'd... Yeah, we'd be concerned, this, too. This time of year, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So it looks like it's going to be a pretty bad week until Saturday and Sunday. Well, at least that's good news. Yeah, I mean, we... Usually it's the weekend that's going to be bad. Right, we always say the weekend's going to be nice, and... I mean, going to be bad, and this week it's going to be nice. So well, good. We can look forward to that. We do. Let's take you to the maps and show you what's going on. Jetstream has pushed on northward. That's the office yeah. presented its master plan for making the falls more of a tourist attraction. There will be 10 different uh, plaques, if you will, but they will be more than plaques. They'll have photographs and information, both uh, from an interest standpoint, educational standpoint, and uh, I think it'll be extremely interesting for the citizens. The information stops are part of a multi-million dollar renovation of the entire Falls Park area. The interpretive part of the plan should make the Falls area more user-friendly for visitors. Well, more than 100 student visitors from Annie Sullivan Elementary in Sioux Falls serenaded employees, including Mayor Gary Hansen today at City Hall for their spring concert. This is the second time since Christmas the classes have sang at the municipality. Sioux Falls City Hall and Annie Sullivan are school business partners. Brass as it made its way across the state of Nebraska today. Along the way, the torch made a stop in North Platte this morning where the Olympic flame was passed between 20 different runners, one of them being News 5's own sports director, John Wilson. John ran the final leg of the relay in North Platte before passing the flame back to the Pony Express where the torch continued its trek across Nebraska. John Wilson will have more on his historic day in North Platte, Nebraska tomorrow on News 5 Sports at 5 piece of history in the making. Exactly. The same with planning to start a petition drive against the boulevard. He says he has no plans of initiating that petition drive. Finally tonight, most of us know it's often difficult for kids to relate to older people and many seniors don't know what makes today's youth tick either. The Geriatric Health Institute of Sioux Valley Hospital in Sioux Falls has a program to help the young and old understand one another. These fifth graders at Lowell Elementary School were visited by senior citizen volunteers today. Each adult is paired with two students where they tell each other stories, reminisce, and participate in other activities. Everybody seemed to learn something today. Um, their openness and their willingness to uh, share with me um, uh, has been uh, just a delight. I learned about um, what it was like when older people were younger and their childhood and they had no phones and how rough it was for them. Today's visit was timely. May is Older Americans Month. I remember stories from older aunts and uncles and grandma and grandpa. You can learn a lot. Yeah, you it's really amazing. can.
It is pretty fun. All right. A lesson for all of us, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for watching News 5 tonight, the station that's working for you. Have a good night and stay tuned for The Tonight Show with Jay Leno next. Have to have the inside knob removed. Others had to be replaced because they were too warped for their frames. They wouldn't um, um, latch without, once you let go of it, they pop open, you know. The food hatches attached to inmate doors are currently being modified because they wouldn't fit. And Sheriff Swenson says basic design problems will make the jail unsafe for workers if left unrepaired. If I'm in here, you can't see me. If I want to play games with you until you come through that door. And it may be too late by the time you realize I'm there, you know, I jumped you. In addition, security cameras in the recreation area are not housed, and Swenson worries by throwing a basketball, an inmate could knock out the picture. Why all these problems so close to the jail's completion date? Swenson says it's simple. They listen to them, not to us. We're not in the most ideal situation. But Davidson County Commission Chair Ronnie Loon says although there may be a few design flaws, the commission made the best decisions they could on their first major construction project. Well, you may regret them, but could you have done anything different at the time? That's the whole problem. Hindsight is always better than foresight. Although the actual construction will probably be completed within the next couple of weeks, inmates won't fill these jail cells until July. And that's when Sheriff Swenson says the facility will be put to the test. In Mitchell, Beth Fuller, News 5. The jail is expected to be turned over to Sheriff Swenson next week. Commissioner Loon says it still will be under budget. A former Sioux Falls man will be spending 40 years behind bars for murder. 52-year-old George Griller was convicted in Minneapolis last month of murdering one of two men whose bodies were found buried in the backyard of Griller's Minneapolis home. Griller admitted killing 27-year-old James Keen, but said he did so to stop Keen from robbing 79-year-old Louis Michael, whose body was the second to be found in Griller's backyard. Both Griller and Michael were originally from Sioux Falls. A 14-year-old Pierre boy will be tried as an adult in connection with the shooting death of a Pierre cab driver in January. After a week-long hearing on the case, Circuit Judge Stephen Zinter has ruled that the 14-year-old, identified as PDJ, will have this case transferred to adult court. 17-year-old Sean Springer of Marshall, Minnesota, has already been transferred to adult court. He's charged with murder, kidnapping, and robbery in the shooting death of Michael Hare. Similar charges are expected to be filed against the 14-year-old. One man is in custody, but Sioux Falls police are trying to find the victim of a barroom assault overnight. Police say 45-year-old Robert Miller allegedly pointed a gun at John Rice during a fight at C.J. Stockman's bar last night. Miller reportedly fired one shot and missed, then shoved the gun in Rice's mouth and tried to fire again, but the gun clicked instead of shooting. Both men fled the scene. Miller was arrested a short time later. Police are trying to locate the victim in the incident, John Rice. He's believed to be in his 40s with dark graying hair, which he wears in a ponytail. Rice is 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighs 160 pounds. Police say he's not in trouble. They just want to ask him questions. Now, if you have any information on Rice's whereabouts, please contact local authorities. Sioux Falls authorities are also looking tonight for a thief or thieves who broke into the Drake Springs pool overnight. As we told you Monday, the pool is stocked with rainbow trout for the Catch a Rainbow program that gives those with disabilities a chance to go fishing and win prizes during the week. But overnight, equipment and prizes along with tools, rods, and reels were stolen from the pool's main building. The people that broke in knew what they were doing and knew what the event was involving, so they had to know who the event benefited. So I guess in my mind, uh, they're pretty low to do it. The perpetrators also used the stolen equipment to fish in the pool and then cut the heads off of some, leaving them behind. If you have any inform information about the crime, contact the Department of Game, Fish, and Parks or your local police. The Minnehaha County Sheriff's Office is asking for your help tonight in finding an 11-year-old runaway. Authorities say Michael Dwayne Feltus left his Hartford area home about 8 last night and was last seen shortly before midnight at the get-and-go on North Cliff Avenue. Feltus is 4 feet 11 inches tall and weighs 95 pounds. He has short brown hair and brown eyes. If you have any information on the whereabouts of Michael Feltus, you're asked to call local authorities.
Well, as News 512 at 10 continues tonight, one of the biggest stories of the day stems from the area, Marshall, Minnesota. It's been documented as the biggest case of food poisoning traced to a single source. It involved Schwann's ice cream that one expert says sickened almost a quarter of a million people. The 1994 outbreak occurred after tanker trucks were used to haul both ice cream mix and raw eggs. Bob Dole is turning his attention from the Senate to the White House. The Kansas Republican says he's giving up his seat for he, that he's held for 27 years to focus his effort to defeat Bill Clinton in November. The resignation takes effect on or before June 11th. And the man most closely identified with Superman lobbied Congress today for more funds for spinal cord research. Actor Christopher Reeve told a packed conference room that if scientists are given enough money, the 43-year-old might walk in time for his 50th birth birthday. Reeve was paralyzed in a horseback riding accident one year ago. He says scientists are within reach of a cure, but will not reach it soon at the present level of funding. In the present level of weather right now, kind of hot and humid for this time of year. It is, but it's kind of a nice change, actually. Yeah, you're right. To feel some summer after the games and escort Olympians. Apple Toffs two weeks leave starts July 16th. Well, coming up on News 5, tonight we begin our in-depth look into the disorder that not only is making life difficult for children that have it, but their families and teachers as well. Here's health reporter Tracy O'Halloran. Seven-year-old Megan McCauley, a second grader, enjoys playing video games. At 15 years old, Andy McCauley, no relation to Megan, has started his first job at Taco John's. Andy and Megan are obviously at different stages in their lives, but even though eight years separates the two, there's one thing they do share in common. Watch Andy as he tries to finish his algebra homework. What may seem like a simple task to an average 15-year-old, for Andy, it's a struggle. The count, the, uh, the things. Now watch Megan work on simple adding and subtracting. Homework many kids her age could do in their heads. But for Megan, she needs counters just to get her through it. The thing I hate most is social studies. And the thing that's difficult is math. How many total do you have? Six. Both Megan and Andy are suffering with attention deficit disorder, or ADD. Therapists estimate that more than a million children in the United States have this neurological disorder that causes confusion, frustration, and anxiety. But what's shocking about the kids who suffer from ADD is for many of them, like Andy and Megan, they have very high IQs. The teacher asks us our quizzes and, um, she, she asked me, um, nine plus six, I'm supposed to know that just like that. When she flips the card over, boom, I'm supposed to know it. Well, that's not going to happen. It's really hard, like, getting arguments with the teachers, ISS, OSS, detention. Now, the most compelling thing about this story is that more than 15 years after doctors put a label to the disorder, teachers still don't know how to deal with it. They just don't understand it, and it's, it's, you know, Megan's involved, but there, there are other kids that are in the classroom, I'm sure, that are involved, too, just parents maybe aren't as tuned into it as Jim and I are. There hasn't been a uh, cross-district training. Um, you know, you hear a little bit about it, but you don't have a lot of training. Tracy O'Halloran joins us now with more on the story. And Tracy, why weren't the teachers in college, when they were in college, prepared for ADD? Well, actually, potential teachers, those who are in college now, are getting more training in their classes than they ever had before. The problem is that some, and I stress some, not all teachers who've been around for a while haven't had the opportunity to train. And so far, no cross-district training has been available for teachers. Tracy, there must be some hope, though, for the teachers, the children, and the families. Well, actually, there is. Um, most of these children, like I said in the story, are very intelligent. They just have a problem concentrating on just one task. Tomorrow night, though, we'll, we'll talk about seminars available for teachers and parents and simple tasks that can be done to make learning easier for the kids. Thanks, Thanks Tracy. Tracy. We look forward to it. As the weekend fast approaches, it's time to make plans, and who better to consult with than our weather forecaster? Scott Bowden is in next to let you know how the rest of our week is shaping up weather-wise. And for farmers around the area, it's not the approaching weekend they're concerned about, it's the approaching spring planting deadline. That story's coming up as News 5 at 10 continues. News 5 at 10 is brought to you by Keystone Outreach.
I can remember when my life seemed hopeless. I had lost my self-respect, my job, and nearly lost my family. Alcohol controlled my life. Then, I went to Keystone for help. At first, I thought I was giving up something. Instead, I was given a whole new life. Keystone's recovery program was the beginning of my freedom. Call Keystone Treatment Center today at 1-800-992-1921. If you believe our new U.S. representative should have over 20 years of successful business experience, providing leadership for dozens of civic and charitable groups, fighting for tax reform, balanced budgets, tough on crime, new jobs, someone prepared to make sure your voice is heard, and your vote counted in the U.S. House of Representatives. Lieutenant Governor Carol Hibbert, tested leadership, getting things done for South Dakota. North area of the state, cool, wet weather has also made planting nearly impossible. Around the Sioux Empire, farmers say most of their corn has been planted, but warm, dry days are needed for them to plant their soybeans. There's a few areas that you've got to uh, leave set uh, because it's too muddy to get in there and plant. Uh, I think in this area around here, we've been able to go most places. Some farmers aren't worried, though. They say time isn't running out yet. They have until mid-June to plant their beans. And I guess we're all just kind of taking the weather one day at a time. It kind of changes so much. Get ready for the skies to light up tonight. There's already a severe thunderstorm warning effective until 945. For western Jackson County, that's not in our coverage area, but that's out west, and that is moving to the east. So it's going to be a hectic night out there. Let's go to the maps and show you where the rain is right now in our coverage area right around the pier area to the west. So if you live in pier, expect some rain to be moving your way in the next 20 to 30 minutes. As far as Gettysburg, Aberdeen, down to Huron, we're seeing some just scattered light thunder showers up there moving around into Aberdeen, a light, light showers. That's just kind of pick up from the Doppler radar right down in Sioux Falls. This is the reason this low pressure system is moving across our state. Very unstable air over us because we got cool air aloft, warm moisture still in the, still moving up from the Gulf. That's going to spark off some showers, so get ready by tomorrow. That low pressure system will move off. Tomorrow will be a little bit like today, thunder showers at night. As far as Friday, though, we're not going to be out of the clear because this cold front is going to clash with the warm air. We're going to see some strong to severe thunder showers on Friday. As far as the weekend, though, we're going to be caught in this pattern where we're going to be blocked off from the cool air and the warm air. That's going to give us a nice weekend, high and dry, with temperatures in the upper 70s. Partly cloudy and warm tonight, moist and unstable air mass could spark off some strong thunderstorms, 60 degrees for a low, 85 degrees tomorrow. We'll see thunder showers at night. Let's bring your five-day forecast in for you. There we go. I can't see it. 85 on Friday, 78 on Saturday, 83 on Sunday. The weekend's looking good. Other than that, though, thunder showers and windy conditions this weekend, but otherwise it's looking pretty nice. KDLT would like to wish good weather to the Olympic torch runners as they pass through St. Joseph, Missouri. Be the fifth. Be sure to listen to John and Audrey on 1037 The Crow tomorrow morning after 7 a.m. Be the fifth caller to name this city for your chance to win a lot of great prizes. And there you go. All right. Thanks, Scott. You bet. Coming up in sports, all of a sudden, the Twins can't seem to find a way to win. And six repeats. Six re we take you to the dramatic trial and see just what it's doing to small-town South Dakota. You may have seen the hit movie Twister, but you don't want to miss our special report tonight on real-life storm chasers. Find out why they're in Sioux Falls. And we'll tell you what Snoopy is doing at a Minnesota wedding. Good evening, I'm Ted Coppy. And I'm Sherry Kurtz. Thanks for joining us tonight. It took a dual county jury just six hours today to find a Brant man guilty of killing his brother. Marlo Hoffman is guilty of first-degree murder in the death of Ronald Doc Hoffman. Hoffman's body was found last June in his Brant bar with his throat slashed. Prosecutors in the case say Marlo killed his brother to avoid being placed in the Yankton Human Services Center. The defense contended Hoffman's admission of guilt after the crime was a symptom of his mental illness and not to be taken seriously. First-degree murder carries a life prison sentence. Well, residents of Duell County will not soon forget the Hoffman trial, not just because Marlo Hoffman was found guilty of murder, but because it was the first murder trial in the county's history. Tonight, Beth Fuller takes a closer look at the impact. Nestled in East Central South Dakota, Duell County is a community that long prides itself on small town values and quality of life. 
But that picturesque reflection changed last June when Doc Hoffman was found in his Brandt bar with his throat slashed. Doc's brother Marla was arrested, charged, and became the first murder trial defendant in Duell County's history. Alternate jurors dismissed this morning before closing arguments say they were hoping to avoid this sign of the times. In a way, it bothers me to think that things like this are starting to happen in Duell County. I guess that's one thing I've always liked about living where I live is that we don't have to worry about murders. And prosecution and defense lawyers, each trying their first murder trial, discovered challenges unique to small-town America. There was a lot of rumor out in the community. That was defense attorney Terry Sutton found jury selection to be one of the most complicated areas of the trial. I made a, a decision early on not to file a motion for a change of location. And once we decided that, then it became an issue of making sure that we would get a reasonably fair jury. Prosecutor John Knight was just as careful as he seated dual county residents who are more accustomed to nonviolent cases like traffic offenses and burglary. The emotions in any trial for me get intense and the stress uh, is something that it makes it very difficult. The arrival of the first murder trial in dual county is not one these residents relish. They hope the next time they judge a neighbor of murder will be many years down the road. In Duell County, Beth Fuller, News 5. A former Sioux Falls police officer has been indicted by a Minnehaha County grand jury. 44-year-old Rick Allen Ristison was arrested this afternoon in a relative's business in Mitchell. The grand jury indictment charges Ristison with alternative charges of possession of a controlled substance and attempted possession of controlled substance as well as false reporting to authorities. The charges stem from an incident that occurred on April 13th. Ristison's arraignment is set for Friday, May 24th at the Minnehaha County Courthouse. A Humboldt teenager has been indicted in connection with a fatal accident, and police say he was drinking just hours before last weekend's accident. 18-year-old Brandon Brahms was indicted by a Minnehaha County grand jury on charges of vehicular homicide, second-degree manslaughter, vehicular battery, and marijuana possession. Brahms was driving a car early Sunday morning that spun out of control and hit a light pole, killing a 15-year-old Hartford girl. Brahms will be arraigned next week on the charges. He's being held on a $50,000 cash bond. As News 512 at 10 continues tonight, increasing temperatures usually lead to increased numbers of homeless people making their way to Sioux Falls. I sleep, you know, and... I'm actually wondering where your next meal is coming from, you know, and a place to stay, you know. Meredith Amos is just one of many homeless who come to or pass through Sioux Falls looking for a hot meal and a place to sleep. Amos is a self-described loner, but homeless people are not all alone. Welfare department officials say most are families who have moved to town looking for work or have had a string of bad luck. Figures from a fe February 1996 report states that in Sioux Falls, the number of persons in homeless families is 142, while the number of homeless individuals is 163. Topping World Watch tonight, wanting to return to the very highest level of safety, the president of ValueJet is cutting its flight schedule almost in half to beep up maintenance checks. This comes in the wake of Saturday's fatal crash in the Florida Everglades. The airline has also been under extra close scrutiny by the Federal Aviation Administration this week. Heavy flooding in West Virginia has turned deadly. A mother and daughter apparently drowned after being swept away by high floodwaters. The, woman, the women rather, were turning, trying to evacuate their one-story home when the waters overtook them. More than 2,000 homes have been evacuated. The governor of West Virginia has extended a state of emergency to 15 counties. Well, it's certainly been a night many of us won't soon forget. Strong thunderstorms wreaked havoc across the Sioux Empire today. Tornado warning after tornado warning was a sure sign of the price we pay for warmer temperatures. But as Scott Bowden reports tonight, as many of us were seeking shelter from the storm, for one group who traveled to South Dakota today, it was time to get up and head out for the chase. Which way is it going? Hey, we need to move! We need to move! Oh my goodness, look at how big that tornado is. That is a giant tornado. It's the chase of a lifetime. Watch faster. Watch faster, Greg. Catching it. You gotta go, buddy. Chasing some of the most violent winds on Earth, they can last moments or stay in the ground for hours. It just happened. I mean, just wham, there it was. For many of us, they're deadly sights. For storm chasers, it's the ultimate high. I have a uh, half-mile-wide tornado on the ground. But I have to say, chasing tornadoes is the biggest high, without a doubt. 
Photographer Randy Frostig is a storm chaser, and hearing that eastern South Dakota was a prime breeding ground for severe weather today, he and other storm chasers from the Weather Channel traveled to South Dakota in search of the big one. To see the, the, the Weather Channel uh, storm chasers up here, they, it, it gives more credence to what we are saying. The Weather Channel storm chasers have been chasing down violent storms all season, from Texas to Oklahoma to Nebraska. We have a potential in our uh, little truck to uh, pull up satellites and radar so we can keep an eye on the storms and decide which way to go. It's certainly a dangerous job, sometimes even coming just a few miles from the actual tornado. But although they're out for the best video they possibly can get, they do know their limits. Oh, it can be kind of dangerous, so um, we, we want to be careful. We'd like to see a tornado, but we want to do anything too foolish. You know, it's, it's only a job, basically. You don't want to lose your life. And Sherry and Ted, when I talked to them today, I asked them if they saw the movie Twister, they all had. And what they said is the movie's really nothing like actually following a tornado they say you really don't get five tornadoes in a the morning then go have lunch and then come back out to five tornadoes so but it's they say they only get to about two miles within a storm that's still close enough more <laughs> than close enough yeah it is really no tornadoes around here except a couple funnel clouds were reported in Watertown, some heavy damage elsewhere. Let's take it to the Almanac and show you where we started out with today. Started out with a temperature of 68, warmed up to 89, we'll bump that 88 up to an 89. Normals are 71 and 46. Records are 97 and 27. Believe it or not, we didn't even come close to the record. Sioux City hit a record of 96. They tied it, actually. Precip, trace of precipitation, we're still well below normal. Sunrise this morning was at 6 o'clock. Sunset was at 846. Let's take a look at your current temperature in Sioux Falls, 70 degrees. Things have gotten mild and things have cooled down. That's the good news. Fair skies, humidity 71%, northwest winds at 14, and the barometer is rising at 29.53. Well, this is the Battle of the Air Masses. This is why we saw all those storms in eastern and central South Dakota. Here we got these 80-degree temperatures coming in today, and then you add in our surface map. There's that upper-level disturbance associated with the cold front, and pow, that's exactly what you get. Look at these storms right here blow up right in the northeastern section from the central. Now, right now, you can see that's where the storms are right now, just to the south of us around Sioux City. As far as the Doppler, we'll put this into motion. You can see exactly what went on. This is last night, the storms that moved off to the northeast. Now, watch throughout the day. You'll see around Pierce, here some scattered showers. Watch these strong storms, boom, right there, right by Aberdeen and Watertown. Hail, golf ball size hail was reported in Aberdeen in Watertown. A few funnel clouds, no damage reported as of yet. But Big Stone County in Minnesota, those that county was the hardest hit with a lot, about $800,000 worth of damage. That has since moved off, watching a couple showers moving to the Sioux City area. Tonight, all the elements for severe thunderstorms, most of it has moved away, but we still have the elements out there, so stay tuned to us. 60 degrees for low by tomorrow. We'll be warming up to 85 degrees, another hot one. The good news is it's going to be very less humid. Sunny to partly cloudy skies and windy and hot. Winds will be out of the west, southwest from 10 to 30 miles per hour. We've got a lot more to talk about, but first we're going to continue News 5, 12 at 10 with Ted, Sherry, and John. Thanks, Scott. And John Wilson in with First Sports and a tragedy at the racetrack today. Tragedy. It's kind of a sorrowful scene at the Indy 500 as death visits the brickyard for the 40th time since the 500 began. It happened to Scott Brayton this afternoon during a practice run. He blew out a tire during practice and slammed into the wall at about 230 miles per hour. When Brayton's car finally came to rest, medical crews found him unconscious before transporting him to a nearby hospital where Brayton died a short time later. We're doing in a business where risk takes place. That's part of the whole thrill of the thing, but not death. That's not part of it, you know. But never did I ever get a scratch in racing. I mean, 12 times I flipped at Riverside, not a scratch. Um, it's just a freak accident. I have nothing more, I guess, to say. It is with the deepest regret that the Indianapolis Motor Speedway announces the death of driver Scott Brayton. 37-year-old Brayton was scheduled to sit on the pole for this year's Indy 500. It would have been his 15th appearance at the Brickyard, which is definitely tragic. I'm sure the Indy 500 will have a new meaning when it happens a couple in about a week and a half or so. Mm -hmm. So, more bad news coming up in sports if you're a Twins fan. <laughs> I was just going to say, I hope you have better news for well, the rest of the no, sport. No, it gets even worse. Well, uh, I guess I can't really say it gets worse, but it is bad news for Twins fans. We'll make you wait for the low... Interesting new friendships. Because they have great opportunities to be in there, and good dancing, and good openings. 
The Special Olympics is fun. It has swimming, it has track and other things, and I, lo I like it. Most athletes compete in two or three events. The Special Olympic Games conclude tomorrow. And good luck to all of them. Yes. When we come back on News 5, two guys turn a roadside taco stand into... With Jerry Kurtz and Ted Coffey. Next on News 5, 12 at 10, do our children eat healthy at school? A bill ready for the president's signature calls for the easing of restrictions on the national school lunch program. Students at a local technical school use their extraordinary skills to construct a sturdy nest out of a not-so-sturdy material. And we have a tale of two ducks and a surprised homeowner and a hungry homeowner's cat. Good evening, I'm Ted Coffey. And I'm Sherry Kurz. Thanks for joining us tonight. Well, eating a well-balanced meal, as most of us already know, isn't easy, but try cooking for hundreds, then try following federal guidelines. A bill now on President Clinton's desk is designed to ease restrictions on the nation's school lunch program. But what effect will it have on the programs here in Sioux Falls? Sean Boyd tells us in tonight's top story. For many children, it's the only balanced meal they get all day. And because of that, and a heightened awareness of general health, more emphasis is being placed on the nutritional value of school lunches. Pizza. President Clinton is expected to sign a measure today which would set new, stricter dietary guidelines for lunch programs. But it comes as no surprise to the Sioux Falls School District. We've been hearing about it for a long time. It's just that now they have they make, taken steps to make sure that, that they're adhered to um, more fully and then giving us some options as to how we're going to reach that. Schools have been following the new guidelines since 1985. Reducing fat content and balancing the meals have been a priority. Already there is no deep fat frying at the elementary level. Schools will now have three ways of getting their lunches to meet nutritional guidelines, giving them more flexibility. Officials expect there will be some additional costs, but say it's too early to tell just how much. Menu changes will come slowly to make it more palatable. More fruits and veggies will be the biggest change in scenery on the lunch tray. This is a fast food generation that we're, that we're dealing with here. And, you know, and kids like the fatty foods, you know. They will make no bones about it. This is what they like. Uh, I guess our biggest challenge is to try to make them tasty and, and appealing um, with less fat. And for most kids, that's a lot to swallow. In Sioux Falls, Sean Boyd, News 5. On another note, a 41-year-old Sisseton man is in critical condition tonight after falling more than 100 feet. Authorities say James Randolph was cleaning the inside of the Volga water tower this morning when he fell down the stem and it landed at ground level in about three feet of water. Crews say Randolph was conscious when rescuers arrived. He was then airlifted to McKinnon Hospital, where again, he is in critical condition. An inmate at the Yankton Human Services Center has been sentenced in an attack on a disabled woman. 35-year-old Charles Searcy of Chicago, Illinois, has pleaded guilty to abusive sexual contact. He was sentenced to 51 months in Yankton with three years supervised release. Authorities say Searcy lured the 41-year-old woman into the gymnasium on the grounds of the Human Services Center where he had sexual contact with her. Well, the lawyer for a Humboldt teenager charged in the fatal car accident explained today what happened on the early morning of May 12th. 18-year-old Brandon Brahms' lawyer said today the Humboldt teen was driving between 40 and 45 miles per hour when someone in the car said something. He turned around, lost control of the car, and hit a light pole, killing a 15-year-old Hartford girl who was a passenger in the car. Brahms pleaded not guilty today to second-degree manslaughter, vehicular homicide, vehicular battery, and marijuana possession. If convicted, Brahms faces a maximum sentence of 25 years in prison. His trial, meantime, has been set for July 29th. A 25-year-old Little Falls, Minnesota man is awaiting charges in the Morrison County Jail tonight after a standoff that left two teenagers with serious stab wounds. Authorities say the man took his 19-year-old estranged wife hostage along with her infant and a 17-year-old boy just before 5 this morning. Six and a half hours later, authorities arrested the suspect. The victim's condition has not been released yet. The baby was not injured in the standoff. Authorities say the suspect was charged earlier this month with domestic assault and sexual assault against his estranged wife. She had taken out a protection order against him. In court news closer to home, by this time tomorrow, you may know a lot more about the disbarment of Sioux Falls attorney Mike Simpkins. The Sioux Falls Argus leader is asking the state Supreme Court to make public the reason for Simpkins' recent disbarment. The state bar, on the other hand, will argue against the request. 
Simpkins gained notoriety when he alleged Governor Bill Jankwill made an improper stock transaction. Since his resignation from the bar, Simpkins has pleaded guilty to failing to file taxes, sales tax rather, for his law firm. State Bar Director Tom Barnett says in a similar case in 1990, the state Supreme Court sided with the Associated Press when they wanted the reason for the disbarment of a Vermilion lawyer. Well, as News 5, 12 at 10 continues, Baltic State lawmaker Mike Wagner says he's not running for re-election. Wagner says job and family considerations are his reasons for not running, but he's not giving up on someday running again for office. Wagner does plan to stay through the end of the year as chair of a committee formed to enhance cooperation between North and South Dakota. In other political news tonight, Republican candidates for the U.S. House are challenging each other to sign campaign promises. Today, John Thune signed a pledge to limit benefits, taxes, and travel if elected. Thune says he will not serve more than three terms or take the congressional pension. He also says he will oppose the use of tax dollars for raises and trips. Thune today also challenged his opponent in June force primary, Lieutenant Governor Carol Hillard, to sign his pledge. But Hillard instead is asking Thune to sign her plan, a 10-point contract with South Dakota that covers many of the same issues that she's already signed. Well, besides Carol Hillard and John Thune on the Republican ticket for June 4th's primary for the U.S. House, the Democratic ticket holds four names, including Jim Abbott, Dennis Jones, Linda Stensland, and Rick Wyland. Independents for the lone House seat have until August 6th to file, and according to the Secretary of State's office, so far no one is on that ballot. In World Watch tonight, gay rights advocates are celebrating while their opponents vow to continue fighting. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down a Colorado measure that would deny homosexuals protection from discrimination. Gay activists call it a breakthrough. Opponents call it judicial tyranny. It was a big day for stocks thanks to an oil deal with Iraq. The United Nations signed a deal today allowing Baghdad to resume selling oil so it can buy food and medicine. As a result, the Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 61 points for its first close above the 5,700 mark. And they didn't mean to do it, but the Forest Service says a group of young people have admitted their campfire may have set off a huge forest fire in Colorado. 10,000 acres have burned since Saturday, along with at least two homes. Those responsible could be fined and jailed. Which I guess with our rain over the weekend, it helped us out a little bit to not have fires in the Right, like not a problem at all with camping season getting underway. That's right. Scott Bowden standing by in the Weather Center with the details, we hope. Well, we saw some scattered showers today, mostly around Mitchell, actually across most of the eastern sections of South Dakota. Let's go to the Almanac and show you. We started off with a temperature of 56 degrees, warmed up to 71. The normals are 72 and 47. It looks like spring has finally sprung, even though it happened a little while ago. Records are 95 and 27. Precipitation, we saw 13 hundredths of an inch of precipitation in the last 12 hours, still below normal. Sunrise tomorrow morning is at 557. Sunset is at 850. Here's some other high temperatures across the region. 69 in Mobridge, 72 in Pier, 73 in Aberdeen and Huron. Those are the warm spots across the region. As far as temperatures at this hour, 59 in Pier. Things are cooling down just a little bit. 58 in Aberdeen, 59 in Huron. 59 degrees right now in Sioux Falls under fair sky, 62% humidity. That's good news. That was up in the 70% range last week. Southwest winds at 6, and the barometer is rising from last hour. Here's the jet stream. You can see it's dipped down to the south, bringing that cooler air from the north. That's why we're cooling down. Tomorrow will be up to 76, but then after that, we'll only be in the upper 60s. So definitely a lot of cooler air moving in. Most of the hot weather is moving off to the east coast. Well, the big news in the weather department was the scattered showers that we saw across the state, right up by around Mobridge, down to Gettysburg and the Chamberlain. Mitchell saw about three funnel clouds today as they saw an isolated thunderstorm. As that moved off to the east, Laverne, Minnesota saw a couple funnel clouds. There was some, also some hail reported in that area. That has generally moved off to the east at around 30 miles per hour. See, still seeing some scattered light showers. But the big news, as the high pressure moves in from the state, you can see it right here just kind of coming in, clearing out the skies. We, that front right there is causing the storms across the Ohio Valley, and that's exactly what we're seeing right as you see it move on from Iowa up into Michigan. That's where most of the severe weather was today. We kind of escaped the severe weather, and I think we will throughout the week, which is good news. Most of the precipitation, too, moved along, and that still is moving to the east coast at around 35 miles per hour. We'll give you a no-wait forecast. It's looking to be a cooler night tonight than last night. We'll see a temperature of 46 by tomorrow. Mostly sunny and pleasant. Get out and enjoy it. 76 degrees. We have more to talk about plus the five-day forecast. Plus continue News 5, 12 at 10 with Ted, Sherry, and John.
Thanks, Scott. With those temperatures, it's hard to imagine that there's still ice sports going on. But indoors, Ted, as the NHL playoffs continue with the four teams remaining. I know you're watching the playoffs with uh, plenty of interest. You'd have to call the Florida Panthers the Cinderella team, the lone Cinderella team, but they have a 1-0 lead against Pittsburgh. <clears throat> Excuse me, going into tonight's game, Sergei Zuboff gave uh, Pittsburgh a 1-0 lead early on. That in the second period, about six minutes later, Yamir Yager shut out in game one. He comes back to score in game two. The Panthers would pick up a couple goals in the third period, but Mario Lemieux also shut out in game one, would also add a goal. That would be the clincher as Pittsburgh goes on to win this one 3-2. to two. That ties the series up at one game apiece. That series will continue on Friday down south in Miami in the warm temperatures of Miami indoors, of course. And, of course, the uh, Western Finals, they continue tomorrow with Detroit and Colorado. The Avalanche up 1-0 in that series. A couple of great series. A couple of great series with plenty more to come. All right. Thanks, John. Yeah. A local communications company gears up to go high-tech. Midco Communications in Sioux Falls got rolling on a $1 million expansion project. Over 100 people were on hand for a special groundbreaking today for the 11,000-square-foot addition to the downtown facility. The new building will house Midco Communications Sales and Administration as well as Midcontinent Media's Information Services Group. The company's existing building will be used for new digital switching equipment, as well as the expansion of Midco's telephone answering and telemarketing services. Officials say the expansion will allow the company to compete in the local market. We'll be another alternate provider. The whole idea of competition, of course, is that prices should go lower, and we're hoping that uh, with everybody trying to develop their own unique selling propositions, the quality will go higher. Construction is expected to be complete by December. Coming up on News 5 at 10, students working on a final project at a local technical school find they need a lot of support for building a piece of history while trying to protect a fragile foundation. Meantime, what would you do to protect two stray ducks who've wandered into your house? And in Medical Minute, bottoms up for an upset stomach and a treatment to help not only reduce wrinkles but stretch marks. More News 5 is next. Stay with us. In Sioux Falls are finishing out the year with a project that involves a little wood, glue, thread, and most importantly, creativity. Tracy O'Halloran tonight has our details. <laughs> the assignment was to design a four-sided pyramid, 12 inches high, 12 inches deep, and 12 inches across at the base, and it had to support 25 pounds from the top. Students could only use four materials to construct the pyramid, balsa wood, glue, thread, and their imagination. But he told us we had to make a pyramid for sure, but to use how much balsa wood and all that stuff, that's kind of tough. I use a lot of thread on mine, which I hope works, but I don't know yet. Some students just couldn't wait to find out, so they tried it early. Last night at 7 o'clock it failed, and at about 11 o'clock I got done rebuilding it again. If it failed today, though, the only fixing that was done was scrambled eggs. The purpose of this is actually to have a lot of fun. Our students have been doing calculations and, and trying to size beams and girders and columns and, and everything, and I decided that this last week of school, let's just have fun. The students thought the project was fun, but they didn't take it lightly. He's making it a big percentage of our grades, so we all had to try really hard to make sure it will work, because otherwise we're going to get docked big time. I'd love to say it's going to work. I hope it works. I, hope, I need the grade. <laughs> Denton and Sandy are breathing easier today since both of their pyramids held the weight. In Sioux Falls, Tracy O'Halloran, News 5. Now, after the contest was over, the students, of course, made a huge omelet with the eggs that were not smashed, luckily. After a rough weekend, will we get a reprieve in our five-day forecast? Scott Bowden is in next. And what goes hand-in-hand hand with warmer weather, but more road construction. This time, again, a major north-south artery is shut down. We'll explain when News 5 continues. Shop Montgomery's furniture and decorating. Strong winds and even a tornado. The storm cut a path of destruction through this farming community outside of Wells, Minnesota. Silos were ripped from their concrete foundation and tossed into nearby fields. Barns were also blown apart and trees splintered like sticks. Straight line winds gusted to nearly 100 miles per hour, scattering debris across the ground. While the farmers in this community continue to clean up today, they still consider themselves lucky because they're still alive. Damage here is estimated at one and a half million dollars.
Incredible, and it sounds like a yo-yo with weather lately. Certainly, as we're going for a roller coaster ride, we had, you know, the strong storms on Friday and Saturday, and now today and tomorrow look like just, gr tonight and tomorrow rather look great nights, and then a cool down. 15 degree cool down by Thursday. Not so. what we want to hear. Uh, yeah, but I miss the cold temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Let's go to the maps and show you exactly what's going on. The jet stream has dipped down to the south, and that's why we're seeing that cooler air move in. Get ready for a yo-yo ride, like Sherry said, as we are going to see 15 degree cooler by Thursday. The jet stream is going to kind of build a trough in, and we're going to see the dry weather actually turn to wet weather. So the best day is tomorrow get out and do something because we have a chance for showers until saturday here's the high pressure as it makes its way in and that's going to give us a mostly sunny day tomorrow as most of the bad weather moves along with this front to the east coast by tomorrow more high pressure moving in that's going to be the best day we'll be around 87 degrees beautiful no clouds in the sky like i said get out and enjoy because by wednesday here comes our strong upper level low that's going to move through bringing us showers for Wednesday, Thursday, and then we got another system coming in on Friday. A week of dramatic changes like I've been talking about. The jet stream's going to kind of build. A construction accident buried alive in a sewage trench. Millions of vehicles are being recalled, but what do you do if one of those cars is yours? And how honest are you or your neighbors? We put some in the Sioux Empire to the test in Five on Your Side. Good evening, I'm Sherry Kurtz. And I'm Ted Coppy. Thanks for joining us tonight. A construction accident in the Hartford area buries a man alive. Authorities have not released the rural Hartford man's name yet. Rescue crews today were called to the scene shortly before 3 this afternoon after dirt walls of a sewer trench the man was in apparently caved in, burying him under 12 feet of dirt. It took nearly an hour for workers to find the man's body. Rescue workers say it was a tedious and difficult search. They weren't exactly sure, according to what the people said, is uh, he's down in the hole and the wall started to cave. They weren't exactly sure exactly where along there he was. The victim's name is being withheld until relatives can be notified. Authorities say an investigation into that accident is underway. A cookout turns violent in Mitchell after an alleged gang member from Omaha shoots a 12-year-old girl in the chest. Tracy O'Halloran has a story on what happened before and after the shooting. I just kept looking at her up and down, and that's when I noticed this gunshot up in her chest, and that blood was coming down, and I just totally lost it. I... The mother of the 12-year-old girl, who wanted to remain anonymous, is still in shock today after her daughter was shot in the chest inside their Mitchell home. And the alleged gunman, a juvenile, is in custody. That much is certain, but the events that led up to the shooting are not. Apparently, the 16-year-old suspect came to Mitchell with a friend from Omaha. The friend introduced the subject to the shooting victim's family, and a group of them cooked out for dinner. The report is that the suspect was drinking heavily, was drinking whiskey, and was, had been belligerent through the night and was armed through the evening. He was talking all night long how he ain't afraid of nobody. He's in a gang, I guess, up in Omaha, Nebraska. He said that he's not afraid of nobody. He'll shoot anybody. I was watching him earlier, probably 15, 20 minutes before it happened, and he was just sitting there rubbing the gun, just sitting there, and he was just looking at everybody rubbing the gun, and then he put it back away in his pocket. About 9.30 last night, police say the 12-year-old girl was shot once in the upper chest. The alleged suspect then fled the scene on foot and eluded police until this morning. At 10 o'clock this morning, police received a call from a woman saying she saw the suspect walking in the 900 block of University Avenue. He was apprehended only seconds later here in the 400 block of McCabe Street, unarmed. Authorities say the suspect has given them an idea of where the gun is located, but it has not yet been found. In Mitchell, Tracy O'Halloran, News 5. The 16-year-old could face attempted murder and aggravated assault charges. No initial court appearance has been set. The victim, meantime, is in stable condition at Queen of Peace Hospital in Mitchell. Well, the next step in a Brookings murder case has been delayed. 25-year-old Timothy Doff of Brookings pleaded guilty but mentally ill to second-degree murder charge for stabbing and killing his former girlfriend, Lorna Amiat, last October. Doff was to be sentenced, but Brookings County State's Attorney Clyde Calhoun says defense lawyers are waiting for the results of some psychiatric reports. He says Doff could be sentenced May 28th if Circuit Judge Rodney Steele accepts the plea. Second-degree murder carries a mandatory sentence of life in prison. Well, as News 512 at 10 continues tonight, a Minnesota appeals court has upheld a settlement in a lawsuit over contaminated Schwann's ice cream. Thousands of people got sick after eating the bacteria-tainted product made at the company's Marshall plant. That led to a class action suit filed on behalf of 13,000 people. 
Separate lawsuits from Illinois and Maryland challenged the settlement, arguing the amount is too low and the attorney's fees too excessive. But the Minnesota Court of Appeals noted Schwann's advised its customers to see a physician and had offered to pay for the exam. An investigation found the contamination was caused by improper storage of ice cream mix in a tanker truck. It's being called the largest safety recall in the history of automobiles, and it could affect your vehicle. Ford will be sending out 8.5 million recall notices to customers in two weeks. Tonight, Sean Boyd talks with some area dealers who say they're preparing for the rush. So, this little device is causing big headaches. Ford Motor Company is conducting the largest auto safety recall in history. Almost 9 million vehicles with a potentially defective ignition switch will be recalled. The problem? The switch could overheat, possibly causing smoke and fire. With such a massive number of customers affected, are dealers concerned about taking care of the problem and keeping owners from blowing a gasket? I think that Ford is going to do a very good job of stepping up with the customers and getting their dealers prepared to take care of the customers in a timely fashion. And I'm confident that we'll be ready. Right now, Ford and Lincoln Mercury service shops in Sioux Falls are only seeing an average 10 repairs a day. That number will skyrocket after June 1st when official letters are sent out. According to a Ford service department official, the problem is easily fixed by installing a new switch. Each repair takes less than an hour to accomplish, but at $50 a piece, this recall could cost Ford Motor Company millions. With almost 9 million possible repairs, totals could reach a half billion dollars. Service departments are gearing up by adding additional staff and trying to get owners in before they get their letter from Ford. They need to get their cars in and get them taken care of and now have some peace of mind that their car is not going to uh, have a fire or anything else happen to it. In Sioux Falls, Sean Boyd, News 5. The vehicles in the Ford recall include some models of Escorts, EXPs, Crown Victorias, Grand Marquis, Lincoln Town Cars, and Aerostars. It also includes some models of Broncos, F-Series light trucks, Mustangs, Tempos, Topazes, Thunderbirds, and Cougars. Again, Ford will begin mailing out notices to their customers in about two weeks. Well, once those cars are back on the street, their owners may pay less for gas. The U.S. House has voted to temporarily suspend a four-cent-a-gallon gas tax increase from 1993. It comes as Energy Department forecasters predict retail gas prices will fall anyway. They say they could drop as much as six cents a gallon by the 4th of July. The long-awaited search of that murky Florida Everglades crater has yielded very little. Drivers say they found only some small pieces of the value jet DC-9, not the big chunks investigators were hoping for. And a mediator in the Freeman standoff has praise for the FBI and harsh words for the anti-government group. Colorado lawmaker Charles Duke says the FBI has tried very hard to find a peaceful solution, and he says most of the Freeman are nothing more than criminals. And on a lighter and weather-related note, what a heck of a day out it there It was today. a great day. Scott Bowden standing by in the Weather Center to tell us if there's more in store. Not only a great day, but a gorgeous night. If anybody's still sitting inside, get out and enjoy it while it lasts. The next few days aren't looking so nice. Let's go to the Almanac and show you what we started out with today. Started out with a temperature of 48 degrees, warmed up to 75. Normals are 70, 72 and 48, so right around normal, actually 3 de degrees above normal for the high. Records are 93 and 25. We saw about no precipitation in the last 12 hours. We're still well below normal. Sunrise, 556. Sunset is at 851. Let's take a look at the current temperatures right now. 63 in Aberdeen, 61 in Watertown, 62 in Brookings, 68 right now in Sioux Falls with fair skies. Humidity is at 35%. Calm winds out there, which is good news. Barometer is rising at 29.85. Well, around here, the Sioux Empire and into Minnesota and North Dakota, a, lot, a big dry day because we're seeing an area of high pressure that's dominating our region. Most of the scattered showers and thunder showers are moving up into eastern, uh, north, eastern Minnesota and into eastern North Dakota, and that's where it's going to stay. Nothing really around here to talk about. We saw some light scattered showers in the, around Pier and down to the south, because we're seeing a little bit of energy moving down into the South Dakota and Nebraska border. But most of that is moving off. We really have nothing to worry about as far as rainfall tonight. But that's going to change, definitely. This is what the national picture looks like right now. We'll put this into motion. Most of the strong storms are right on the eastern seaboard associated with this front. And there's that tropical low that's dumping a lot of rain down into portions of all of Florida, rather, mostly down by Miami. They're seeing some strong 
some strong rain right now. But you can see another wave of energy is moving into our region, and that's going to bring in a lot of wet weather for the next three to four to five days. Probably we won't see drying out until about Monday when we all go back to work. That's good news. Here's that low pressure I've been telling you about that's kind of spinning a lot of, a lot of rain down there. Really not a lot of strong weather, but that is definitely bringing some rain. There's that front that's bringing some rain to the east coast. Around here, nice high and dry because of that high pressure system that's just sticking around our area tonight, but by tomorrow, like I've been saying, things are going to change tonight. You may see some dark clouds out there, but that's really no rainmaker clouds. 51 degrees by tomorrow, we'll see some thunder showers. 74 degrees. We have a lot more to talk about, but let's continue News 5, 12 at 10 with Ted, Sherry, and John. Thanks, Scott. And NBA playoffs net a top spot in tonight's sport. Continuing tonight in the Eastern Conference Final with the Bulls wanting to take a 2-0 lead with Horace Grant riding the pine. Shaquille O'Neal have to pick up his game a little bit in Game 2, otherwise they will be down 2-0. There's Michael receiving his MVP award for this season, and Shaq did pick it up early on. There's the slam down the boulevard as the Magic jump out to an 11-7 lead. Once again, Shaq again, 30-20 Magic. We're still in the second, but here come the Bulls and Michael Jordan. Jordan, 17 points in the third quarter. Here's just a few of them right there as the Bulls lower their horns and come roaring back from an 18-point deficit right now. This game with about 10, 15 seconds left in it. Chicago out in front, 90-83 Bulls looking to take a 2-0 lead before the series switches back down south to Florida coming up this weekend. Horace Grant says he will return on Saturday for Game 3. That's so good for the Magic. Good for the Magic. They will need him. It looks Actually, like they it. looked really good tonight, but just fell apart in the second half. So it goes. So it goes. Thanks, John. Making room for a shopping center parking lot in the historic district of Sioux Falls ended up being a tight squeeze. Residents in the 1100 block of East 8th Street are angry after a house was moved there. Now, they're not mad the house was gone, but that the structure, which was 35 feet wide, was taken down Summit Avenue, which is only 38 feet wide. As a result, a large number of tree branches had to be cut to make room for that house. Some say Prairie Avenue would have been a better choice for the move. Mayor Gary Hansen has directed the traffic engineer to determine the best route before moving another house. When News 5 at 10 continues, as the saying goes, honesty is the best policy, but exactly how honest is society today? We find out tonight in Five on Your Side. A group of budding young, young authors become educators in the classroom for the afternoon. And it's considered a sacred symbol to many American Indians, but tonight there are signs of illness. More on that story next on News 5. News 5 weather is brought to you by Franklin Motor Company, the area's largest independent automobile dealer. When you're shopping for a car, you deserve a choice. At Franklin Motor Company, you can choose from over three... ...a phone call, and no one has tried to return the wallet. Now, if you have a consumer story idea or have been the victim of a scam, you can call our News 5 Consumer Hotline at 361-5555, extension 43, or toll-free, you can call one 800 727 5358 or KDLT. Well, we hope you got out and enjoyed today's nice spring like weather because weather forecaster Scott Bowden says it's going to change. But nothing like the ironic change of weather this drive in movie theater got caught in. It's a strange twist of events coming up when News 5 at 10 continues. That's pretty incredible. Here's a whole new meeting. Ridge Indian Reservation. Free service. And here in Sioux Falls, people came prepared to brave the cold and rain for a special Memorial Day service to salute our veterans. Reporter Andrea Barber tells us tonight the ceremony moved inside, but thoughts were elsewhere today. The Star-Spangled Banner played as a tribute to our nation's heroes began. opportunity to uh, pause and reflect on the, the many men and women who have served our country, uh, not only those in, in peacetime, but also uh, in wartime. I think it is partially just bringing everyone together, remembering as a whole, everyone who's no longer with us. Today, over 250 people packed the VFW Lodge in Sioux Falls to celebrate Memorial Day by remembering family members, friends, and other veterans who gave their lives to serve their country. I lost one of my classmates in Vietnam, uh, Kirby Doherty, and there were 
forget him. I think I'm when I uh, come to the VFW, American Legion. No matter what group I'm with, it's a veterans group. I think of my friends, yes. I think of them all the time. It was also a chance for veterans to look back on their own experience and continue the healing process. I always think back. Uh, I served uh, 32 months uh, in the South Pacific. And uh, I think of my friends that are still there. Meantime today in our nation's capital, President Clinton led the traditional wreath-laying ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery. Clinton laid the wreath before the Tomb of the Unknowns at the cemetery. Clinton said today that as we honor the battle, those who made brave sacrifices in battle, we should also remember to honor those who served at times of peace. And in New York, five wreaths, on rep one representing each branch of the service, were dropped from the aircraft carrier Intrepid to honor the country's war dead. Back here in the Sioux Empire, the rain not only interfered with local Memorial Day ceremonies, it's beginning to cause flooding. Runoff from rain the past eight days is flooding low bank areas on the Big Sioux River from the Brookings area to near Sioux Falls. Rain since May 19th has total, totaled about two inches in most of the river's drainage area south of Brookings. The Big Sioux is one half foot over flood stage at, check, at a checkpoint there, and on the north edge of Sioux Falls, the river is one foot below flood stage. Another inch of rain in some areas could boost the Big Sioux by more than a foot, according to the National Weather Service. Well, high water is also somewhat of a problem in western South Dakota tonight, where flood warnings are issued for parts of seven counties. The Weather Service says there are reports of up to seven inches of rain since Wednesday. Visitors at Mount Rushmore, meantime, had to contend with snow today. Heavy blowing snow forced the highway patrol to close one highway in the upper Black Hills near Custer. An accident early today in northwestern Minnesota brings the number of Memorial Day weekend fatalities to at least 13. Clay County authorities say a male died when his car crossed a highway, hit an approach, and flew 30 feet before landing in a ditch and striking a tree next to the Red River. Authorities today also identified three family members killed in a head-on collision yesterday near Marshall, Minnesota. The state patrol says Myron and Linda Hash and Dustin Codron were all dead at the scene. Another passenger in the car was seriously injured. The accident happened yesterday afternoon on Minnesota Highway 23 north of Marshall. The driver of the other car was airlifted to a Minnesota hospital. A South Dakota state trooper is in fair condition tonight after a collision between his highway patrol car and a train. 33-year-old Don Zimmer was hospitalized yesterday after the accident just east of Sherman. Zimmer's car was crossing the railroad tracks when the accident occurred. Witness says the train whistle was blowing at the time of the accident, but says other accidents have occurred at this intersection, which has no flashing lights or crossing arms. The Minnehaha County Sheriff's Office is investigating that accident. South Dakota Senator Larry Pressler has introduced legislation in the Senate to roll back a tariff on imported fireworks, an obscure provision in the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, more than double the tariff on imported fireworks, most of which are made in China. Pressler says some rural towns in the Midwest may have to give up their fireworks shows this summer because of the high tariff. Rich Brothers Fireworks President Mike Rich says no town has canceled the show because of increased costs. The pilot of a United Express commuter plane is credited with getting down a plane in one piece at the Des Moines, Iowa airport last night after he lost power in two of the plane's engines. United Express Flight 5558 was headed to Moline from Denver when all four engines went out. The pilot managed to get two of them restarted and landed the plane safely. There were 54 passengers on board. They were loaded onto a bus for the last leg of the trip to the Quad Cities. Mechanics still aren't sure what caused the engines to quit. In World Watch tonight, the voice recorder from Value Jet 592 was quickly yielding clues to the plane's crash. Six minutes into the flight, it indicates a fire in the passenger cabin and it suggests passengers had trouble getting oxygen before the plane went into the Florida Everglades. The crew of the space shuttle Endeavour took time out from tracking an experimental satellite today. They linked up via radio for a chat with fellow space travelers, including American astronaut Shannon Lucid on the Russian space station Mir. Endeavour is in its ninth day in space. And overseas, a British farmer is finding a new way of making money from his livestock, advertising. Harry Good is selling advertising space on the side of his cows. So far, he's sold space on eight cows grazing in fields next to a busy motorway. 
Osgood was facing financial hardship as beef consumption in England dropped because of mad cow disease. Among those helping him get some of that money back is Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They're going right for a cow side. Ad is $430. From mad cows to ad cows in England. What do you say, Scott? Maybe we should put ads on our jackets, make a little money here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm starting to think it's winter. Can you believe six inches of snow out in the Black Hills? Some even reports of eight inches. And tonight they could see some more from about 5,000 feet up. And wind chills around here made it feel like it was in the 20s and 30s. We only warmed up in the 40s and a lot of rain in the area. Let's go to the Almanac and show you what's been going on since this morning. 45 we started out with. Look at this. We only warmed up to 49. That's 4 degrees in the last 12 hours. Normals are 74 and 50. Records are 92 and 29. We saw about a three-quarters of an inch of precipitation in Sioux Falls, and look, it, we're getting closer to normal for precipitation. We're still below normal, believe it or not. Sunrise, 551. Sunset is at 857. Let's take a look at some of your high temperatures today. 48 in Pier, 54 in Aberdeen, 49 in Watertown, and 47 in Sioux Falls it warmed up to today. Our current temperature is not cooling down much. 49 in Aberdeen. 51 in Watertown, 47 right now in Brookings, 45 in Sioux Falls, still overcast out there with 96% humidity. Winds are out of the east at 18 miles per hour, and the barometer is holding steady at 29.84. Well, let's show you, set up the picture for you, what's been going on the last 24 hours. Look at this low pressure system right four or five days a week, and it's, I just love it to death. The love of the sport, and with today's weather, some dedication keeps these water skiers coming back. It affected me already this morning. I was a little hesitant getting out here today, but um, like Bob said, that you've got to you've got to psych your mind up to just do the show and don't worry about what's going on around you. The cold and rainy conditions kept a lot of spectators home today, but some came a hundred miles just to see their kids perform on opening day. So, were you prepared for the weather? Do you want to see my underwear? <laughs> too cold if you're sitting in a group, I guess. No matter what the conditions are, these die-hard fans know they'll be in for a great show since it's a whole new season. We've got a, a brand new show, a lot, all new costumes. You're going to see a lot of pre-built pyramids. You're going to see a lot of excellent swivel skiing, a lot of barefooting, and a lot of just overall excitement in the show that we've got built in this year. My favorite would be um, the pyramids, definitely like the pre-built pyramids, which is their opening act, and then our final pyramid. And I also like ballet because it lets the girls show off their stuff alone without the boys. But others came just to see the boys. Um, I'm watching Jeremy Ski. Hopefully this weather won't last all summer, and you too will come out and watch the boys and girls. In Sioux Falls, Tracy O'Halloran, News 5. Rain, rain, go away. That's the sentiments of most in the Sioux Empire today. But when will our wish come true? We'll check it out with forecaster Scott Bowden next. And we take you to one part of the Midwest that's cleaning up today. That says the calf looks like a purebred buffalo calf, and he's never seen anything like it. In our medical minute tonight, according to the Centers for Disease Control, in a little more than a decade, the death rate for asthmatics aged 15 to 24 is up nearly 120 percent. What's more shocking, virtually every asthma death is preventable. No one should die from asthma. Joan Esposito reports. Steve Caravalos is taking a test that will tell doctors how well his lungs are working. The 14-year-old was diagnosed with asthma at age 6, making him one of the nearly 5 million American children who struggle to breathe because of this illness. My dad was, he would stay there with me at night in the hospital beds when I was 6. I remember that. This is what happens with asthma. As you breathe out, muscles tighten, constricting the airway. Irritation and mucus add to the trouble breathing. The major symptoms, coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. There are many triggers. Indoors, house dust, feathers, molds, animals, and outdoors. Pollens and mold spores from outdoors. Asthma is treatable, but doctors say too many families wait too long to get help when asthma turns critical. Take your child to the emergency room when an asthma attack is unusually severe or lasts unusually long. Steve will be most at risk of dying from asthma when he hits his late teen years. From 1980 to 1993, for those aged 15 to 24, the asthma death rate jumped 118%. You have to take good care of it. The station that's working for you, the Tonight Show with Jay Leno's next. Have a good night.
like a pinpoint where it came in and then it gets bigger here and it gets bigger here. Sioux Falls police say the crime spree that left bullets scattered around her home started around midnight with a stabbing at 11th Street and Summit Avenue. 25-year-old St. Louis resident Mark Morgan was treated and released from a Sioux Falls hospital for multiple stab wounds. Minutes after that call, officers responded to reports of shots fired at 2708 Pioneer Trail. The woman we talked to who did not want to be identified says she thinks her boyfriend, 17-year-old brother, was the intended target because of an ongoing feud with people who've tried to attack him before. She says he'd heard rumors that the group had a gun and were looking for him. She says the assailants caught up with the boy here at this parking lot. They ambushed him and began firing. Fortunately, he escaped unharmed and called police. They have given us the name of a suspect that the officers are looking for at this point. It, I don't have an indication of, of the motive or why they think this person might be a suspect. The woman on Pioneer Trail hopes police have the suspect in custody soon because she worries whoever came last night could strike again and next time someone could get hurt. In Sioux Falls, Beth Fuller, News 5. Please continue their investigation and are still following leads. If you have any information, you're asked to call the Sioux Falls Police Department or Crime Stoppers. A 14-year-old boy pleaded not guilty today to charges of murder, kidnapping, robbery, and grand theft. Paul Dean Jensen Jr. became the second teenager accused in the January 26th killing of Michael Hare, a peer taxi driver who was robbed and then shot three times. A grand jury met this morning and indicted Jensen on 11 counts. 17-year-old Sean Springer of Marshall, Minnesota is the other charged in that death. If convicted of murder or kidnapping, 14-year-old Jensen faces a minimum sentence of life in prison, a maximum sentence of death by lethal injection. A Nebraska man is in jail on charges he assaulted a Brookings police officer. 30-year-old Edward Blaze Kula is charged with attempting to ram Brookings police officer Gail Handegard at a roadblock, driving while under the influence of alcohol, eluding police, reckless driving, and driving while his license was revoked. Kula allegedly led police on a long chase Saturday. An environmental trust fund for the city of Sioux Falls created with a penalty payment from the John Morellan Company will stay under federal control. The company paid a $3 million fine for polluting the Big Sioux River in Sioux Falls. $1 million will be set aside to create an environmental trust fund for projects to clean up or enhance the use of the river. Sioux Falls City Attorney Janet Brecky says any proposal to spend the money must be approved by a federal judge. Well, as News 512 at 10 continues to sp tonight, despite today's break from the recent rain and cool weather, 80 to 90 percent of the cropland north of Highway 14 is not planted because of flooding. As Sean Boyd reports tonight, the more time goes by, the more farmers become concerned. This is the scene across much of northern South Dakota. Water and mud stands where seedlings should be. An extremely wet spring with little sun is making cropland impossible to plant. Jerry Odegaard has been farming here for more than 40 years. Well, I've never seen anything like this. Not continuous. You might get a year of flooding, you don't get part of it drowning out, but I've never seen it hang on like this. Of his 800 acres of cropland, he has only planted 119 acres. His land is especially vulnerable to flooding. It sits along the Big Sioux River. When his farmland turned to swampland more than four years ago, Jerry Odegaard wonders what does the future hold for his son and other young farmers. Depressing situation. You feel worse for your... Well, I've got a young son starting far, started farming with me last year. And, and uh, he really hasn't had much to look forward to, you know, and it, for a young farmer, it's very tough. It's very, very hard. Richard Intermill is one of the lucky ones. He's planting today. His land is spread out and farther south. It's also very sandy, which allows the water to seep away. We appreciate this light soil now, but if it don't rain, that's when the corn is knee high twice, once coming up and once going down. June 5th is the deadline for Odegaard's soybean insurance, but he hasn't even planted most of his corn yet. That insurance deadline was May 25th. Now all he can hope for is dry weather and a better crop next year. When you look forward to next year, you know, you wonder where the money is going to come from to put the crop in. And that's a, that's a problem. Near Bruce, Sean Boyd, News 5. In World Watch tonight, in Israel, election exit polls show opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu 
has pulled slightly ahead of Prime Minister Shimon Peres. Free. The FBI does not want journalists contacting the Freeman. And a California appeals court has overturned Hollywood Madam Heidi Fleiss's conviction on pandering charges. In a scathing opinion, the court ruled that jurors had turned the trial into a farce by engaging in misconduct to avoid a deadlock. Scott Bowden joins us now with our first look at weather. And Scott, we almost have nothing to talk about because all the rain moved away. We have sunshine. For his sentencing, Jose Sanchez prayed for more than an hour, criticizing the United States government and treatment he's received in the Minnehaha County Jail. Sanchez did not talk about his earlier admission of stabbing Calixio Arnales last July. He had claimed it was in self-defense and that the two men were fighting over a woman. Judge Jean Paul Keene handed down the sentence today. He says even though the victim was a homeless, illegal immigrant, his murder is as serious as any murder. The Sioux Falls man involved in a standoff with police in February was sentenced today for the crime which led to the standoff. 38-year-old David Iwerks received a 12 and a half year sentence for second degree rape. He admits to raping and threatening a woman with a gun earlier this year. When police confronted him about the incident, he refused to leave his home and threatened suicide. Today, Iwerks told the judge he was drunk at the time and doesn't remember the incident, but said he trusts the woman who reported it and is trying to have a relationship with her. A former Watertown disc jockey pleaded guilty today to two counts of sexual contact with a child under the age of 16. 37-year-old Dan Dahlgren's guilty plea was part of a plea agreement to drop one count of second-degree rape and two counts of sexual contact. Dahlgren was a radio announcer with KDLO, KIXX, and KWAT in Watertown until he was arrested last August. Dahlgren has been released on $25,000 bond until his sentencing, which is June 28th. Each of the sexual contact charges carries a 15-year maximum in prison and a $15,000 fine. The U.S. Supreme Court gave the go-ahead today for national banks to charge late payment fees for credit card holders, even if states ban such levies. The decision could net hundreds of millions of dollars each year for the banks. In the credit card case, the court said national banks that locate their home base in friendly states like South Dakota are allowed to charge interest on credit card balances at rates permitted by the state. The court adds the late payment fees are included in federal banking law's definition of interest. South Dakota has no ceiling on interest charges. Citibank officials say the ruling is a victory for free market pricing. As News 5, 12 at 10 continues, South Dakotans head to the polls tomorrow to define the shape of the November general election. In the primary tomorrow, Minnehaha County Republican voters will choose two GOP candidates to appear on the County Commission general election ballot. Incumbents Robert Colby and Jerry Noonan are running for re-election. Robert Heim Himrick, rather, and Brett Songstad are also trying for the seats. In the U.S. House rate, Carol Hillard and John Thune are running for the Republican ballot. Democratic voters will choose between Jim Abbott, Rick Wyland, Linda Stensland, and Dennis Jones. Now, if one candidate in the Democratic race does not get 35% of the vote, the top two vote-getters will have a runoff election. Minnehaha County polling places will be open from 8 a.m. until 7 p.m. tomorrow. Secretary of State Joyce Hazeltine says she thinks 44% of Republicans and 34% of Democrats will vote in tomorrow's state primary. She bases her prediction on similar elections in previous years. A veteran state politician is calling it quits on the South Dakota Public Utilities Commission. 62-year-old Ken Stauffer, a Democrat, has served on the PUC since 1978. Stauffer says he's decided it's time to do something else. He was found guilty in 1994 of using his state phone for non-government purposes in order to pay restitution and do 50 hours of community service work. Democrats will meet later this month at their state convention to pick a candidate for the general election ballot. Well, an interim president has been named to succeed current University of South Dakota President Dr. Betty Turner Asher. The South Dakota Board of Regents today named Paul Olskamp to the interim post. Olskamp is the former president of Bowling Green State University in Ohio. His duties will run from August to June of next year. Dr. Asher announced last month she would resign at the end of June. In regional news tonight, four Iowa business leaders died yesterday when their plane crashed into a swamp north of Aiken near Blind Lake, Minnesota. The four men were returning from a fishing trip in Canada. Searchers found the Piper Malibu upright, missing a portion of the tail and wing. Authorities are unsure whether yesterday's rainstorms and wind could have contributed to the crash. The four men were from Ottumwa, Iowa. The Federal Aviation Administration is investigating that accident. 
Last week, News 5 brought you the story of a local family battling a rare genetic disorder. Tonight, a benefit concert is being held in honor of Paul Van Voren and his family. Paul has von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, which causes tumors to grow throughout the body. His mother died from it. His sisters are struggling with it. Donna Chapel organized the event and is tonight's mistress of ceremonies. Together with a unified feeling of caring for Paul and his family, and, and that's my goal for the evening is just one big, happy, good feeling going through the whole crowd. Paul Van Voren says he cannot express in words how he feels. It's up and down. You got a, a lot of friends showing up and a lot of people I don't know. and It's just uh, it's a good feeling knowing that people care. Uh, you know, they're going to come out for something like this. Now, if you weren't able to make it to the benefit tonight in Sioux Falls, you can still drop off donations at any Norwest Bank location. In World Watch tonight, two more tests for the AIDS virus are available. The Food and Drug Administration today approved an oral test used to detect infection. The other test is aimed at determining how fast patients with the deadly disease will sicken. Studies show that patients with high HIV blood levels are more likely to sicken quickly. Crash investigators, meantime, have wanted to find electrical circuit breakers from Value Jet Flight 592 to see if they might have caused the fire aboard the doomed airliner. They say they've now found a part of the circuit breaker panel. Federal agents say a trucker hauling wreckage had stolen it. It could be dark tonight inside the Freeman compound in Montana. The FBI pulled the plug on electricity to the ranch today in an effort to push the 71-day-old standoff to a close. Neighbors say they're certain the Freeman have power generators of their own. Scott Bowden sitting in our weather center, and I think we're all ready to turn that heat back up up.